Today we got some more actual history about Lewis Wetzel. This is the third of the three Lewis Wetzel videos that we are releasing within one week on Unworthy History. We'll be reading from this book, Lewis Wetzel, the renowned Virginia Ranger and Scout, His Life and Adventures, by Robert Cornelius V. Myers. This book was published all the way back in 1890. It is well known that Lewis Wetzel excelled as a marksman. He is said to have been able to shoot and then reload while constantly running. Whereas Lewis Wetzel's preferred weapon was the rifle, his older brother Martin preferred the tomahawk. In this chapter, we'll first hear about the Indian chief Logan, who tried to adopt the civilized way of life, but whose family was ruthlessly attacked by General Cresap and his men. Logan then went to war against the whites, but again made peace with the settlers. The presence of Logan as a civilized Indian was something that made Lewis Wetzel reconsider his hatred and his vow of vengeance toward all Indians, after his father's death. We'll then read about Martin Wetzel's revenge for his father's death. Because Martin was older than Lewis, he would have the earliest chance to wreak his vengeance. Yet of Lewis Wetzel, no specially remarkable action is recorded from the time of his escape from Indian captivity until the year 1782, when he was 18 years old. It would seem that he disappeared from the eyes of those who knew him, until he could command a man's attention. His boyish strength may not have been sufficient for his would-be enterprise, and doubtless he recognized the fact and daily increasing his bodily endurance, patiently waited for the coming of manly vigor, which should gain him the vengeance he desired. He said in after years that this waiting time was the discipline of his life. There were raids on the Indians all around him when he again appeared, and he took a general part in them, and never save in company with others, but nothing was done to distinguish him from the other half-wild boys of the settlers who fought like him for the honor and safety of those most dear to them, these boys who so often did the work of men in tilling the soil and tracking the game necessary for the daily food of the families. Logan was the second son of Shekelemus, and this is the same person who Heckewelder describes as a respectable chief of the Six Nations, who resided in Shamokin, Pennsylvania, as an agent to transact business between them and the government of the state. In 1747, at a time when the Moravian missionaries were the object of much groundless hatred and accusation, Shekelemus invited some of them to settle at Shamokin, and they did so. When Count Zinzendorf and Conrad Weiser visited the place several years before, they were very hospitably entertained by the chief, who came out to meet them, says Loskiel, with a large, fine melon, for which the count politely gave them his fur cap in exchange, and thus commenced an intimate acquaintance. Logan was a shrewd and sober man, not addicted to drinking like most of his countrymen, because he never wished to become a fool. Indeed, he built his house on pillars for security against the drunken Indians, and used to ensconce himself within it on all occasions of riot and outrage. Logan inherited the talents of his father, but not his prosperity, nor was this altogether his own fault. He took no part except that of peacemaker in the French and English War of the 1700s, and was ever before and afterwards looked upon as emphatically the friend of the white man, but never was kindness rewarded like this. The countless stories that have come down to us relative to this chief are doubtless not unknown to many who read this narrative, for scarcely a book that refers to Indian life is complete without a story or anecdote of Logan, yet one that has received little attention, if any, came to the present writer from the lips of an old trapper, whose father had told it to him one day, when they entered their claim for a tract upon a land which had once stood the cabin of the chief, no traces of which were now to be seen amid the rank vegetation that covered the place. Logan had built his house and had moved his family into it, trying to live like the civilized white man. He had made three chambers in his house, one for himself and his wife, a second for that of his children, while a third was reserved for any chance stranger, Indian or white man, who might crave shelter at his hands. 
The trial must have been severe. Four close walls were suffocating to a man who had doubtless rarely slept under a roof before, and in whose veins ran the blood of an ancestry that had known nothing of houses. But he was determined to act like a civilized man, and to represent the progressive element of the times. For nights he never slept, and he could hear his wife complaining at his side, while in the adjoining chamber the rest of the family were moving about discontentedly. After a repetition of such a night on five successive occasions, Logan arose at last one night, after tossing about for hours, and on hearing no sounds from his wife, who had laid herself upon the floor to try and snatch a little sleep, which the newness of a bed had destroyed, he concluded that she was happily resting. Lucky woman, he said. He moved carefully about. He was determined to sleep too, but he could not sleep under a roof. Cautiously going to the hole that served for a window, he threw himself out upon the ground, dragging his blanket after him, and reaching a little hollow in the ground formed by the trunks of some massive trees, he laid down for a nap. But he made up his mind not to sleep long, for the wife and family must not know of this proceeding, as he had determined when he built the house that civilization must be followed, and that no infringement upon it dare be allowed. He would rest for an hour or so, and then would regain the house and nobody be the wiser. It was comfortable here on the hard ground, beneath the twinkling of the stars, the free, fresh breezes fanning his face and entering his nostrils. How he enjoyed that sleep! He slept at last as he thought he had never slept before, certainly as he had not slept since his house had been built. How long he slept he did not know. He woke with a start. The day was breaking, and in the east a faint pink glow was spreading like the blush of a baby over the clear sky. He gathered his blanket around him and ran precipitately toward the house. Suppose he had been missed. If any of those inside knew of this escapade, there would be no discipline of civilization thereafter. But none of those inside were to know, for on nearing the place in the faint early light, he saw a shadow upon the wall. He looked up and there was his wife's blanket hanging over the eaves, while one foot peeped down at him. She had gone up in the night and sought the roof for a bed. He was startled, but he was startled the more when on hearing a suppressed yawn near at hand, he looked about him and saw suspended from the window of the second chamber two blanketed forms, the other members of the family. The story does not go on to say how insomnia under a roof was cured after this, but it is known that this same house was presented by Logan to the missionaries and was held by them while the family of the chief went further up the country and built another house there. This second house, claiming the admiration of the missionaries, it was likewise presented to them. The houses had been built with great exertion, and months had been taken up in their construction. But so reverently did the chief regard the men who had come to instruct the Indian tribes, and teach them the truth of a god who kept not perpetual hunting grounds as a reward for the brave men that he called children, but who held in reserve peace and rest for oppression and relief for those who did their best towards establishing peace and rest upon the earth, that he regarded his own worldly possessions as nothing if they could contribute to the comfort of these teachers of the universal religion. Logan and his family worked for the white teachers, gave them of their substance, and protected them from the incursions of warriors who did not understand the teachings other than as further modes of cheating and getting the upper hand. Logan stood the friend of these Indians too, however, and tried to make them comprehend, and pitied them when they could not, as in very many instances was the case. The settlers knew all of this and regarded Logan kindly. This was the man Lewis Wetzel had heard of all his life, and had been taught to believe in implicitly, but now he doubted him and classed him with the other red men, his sworn enemies, whom he meant to kill, and others too now saw as he did, for events had been represented to the simple settlers in such a perverted form that rage burned in the bosoms where affiliation had long endeavored and desired to assert itself. In the spring of 1774, a robbery and murder occurred in some of the white settlements on the Ohio River, which were charged to the Indians, though perhaps not justly, for it is well known that a large number of civilized adventurers were traversing the frontiers at this time, who sometimes disguised themselves as Indians, and who thought little more of killing one of that people than of shooting a buffalo. A party of these men, land jobbers and others, undertook to punish the outrage in this case, according to custom as Jefferson says in his notes, in a summary way, Colonel Creesap, a man 
man infamous for the many murders he had committed on that much injured people, collected a party of white men and went in quest of vengeance. A canoe of women and children was seen coming down the Kanawa, and there was laughing and happiness, the little floating party not at all suspecting an attack from the whites. Creesap and his party concealed themselves on the bank of the river, and the moment the canoe reached the shore, singled out their objects and at once fired and killed every person in it. This happened to be the family of Logan, innocent and friendly inclined. Shortly after this, another massacre took place, not far from Wheeling, a considerable party of the Indians being decoyed by the whites and all, with the exception of a little girl, murdered. Among these two were both a brother of Logan and a sister, the delicate condition of the latter increasing a thousandfold both the barbarity of the crime and the rage of the survivors of the family. Logan, therefore, came sternly from his cabin, where he had meant peace, and distinguished himself by his daring and bloody exploits in the war which now ensued between the Virginians on the one side and a combination of Shawnee, Mingo, and Delaware on the other. The civilized party prevailed as usual, and wiped out a considerable number of Indians, but many of their dead they scalped, rather than we should have them, says the white historian, and naively goes on to narrate, but our troops scalped upwards of twenty of those who were killed. Thus did the whites imitate what they looked upon with aberrance at the hands of the base savage. It was at the treaty after this that Logan, that much injured man, made this noble speech. I appeal to any white man to say if he ever entered Logan's cabin hungry, and he gave him not meat, if he ever came cold and naked, and he clothed him not. During the course of the last long and bloody war, Logan remained idle in his cabin, an advocate for peace. Such was my love for the whites that many countrymen pointed as they passed, and said, Logan is the friend of white men. I had even thought to have lived with you but for the injuries of one man, Colonel Creesap, the last spring, in cold blood and unprovoked murdered all the relations of Logan, not sparing even my women and children. There runs not a drop of my blood in the veins of any living creature. This called on me for vengeance, and I have sought it. I have killed many. I have fully glutted my vengeance. For my country I rejoice at the beams of peace, but do not harbor a thought that mine is the joy of fear. Logan never felt fear. He will not turn on his heel to save his life. Who is there to mourn for Logan? Not one. The elegance in this speech is incomparable. No wonder the man was called a prophet. He was a man in advance of his times, and the times were sufficiently startling for the settlers, and they had not the leisure nor inclination to study out the excellences of one character when they had all they could do to subvert the evil intentions of characters less prone to good. He stood alone, aloof from friends and foes, unknowing friends with foes on every side. It is probable that his own blood hated him more than the strangers did. He represented the progressive element, and such an element must ever appear more aggressive to friends who do not partake of it, than to foes who are in a like state of ostracism from its influence. If the man understood his own inclinations, it is as much, indeed more than, could have been expected of him in the minds of calm, rational reasoners. In the most peaceful and settled age, when art and science both contend to make thought the common property, a new element appearing creates in the minds of the mass a wonder not unmixed with ridicule. Any subversion of established usage excites first opposition, which means oppression, then ridicule, which is the loosening of the oppression, and the establishing of the principle upon the plane of equality, then the adoption of the principle, which is its elevation to superiority over its surroundings. Logan thus represented principle, but it is doubtful if he ever got beyond the first stage, that of oppression with his fellows. He had every right to look to civilization to uphold him, but the acts of his own people had caused civilization to pause, and a pause in any attempted improvement is a retrogression. He appealed to the white settlers. He said that he wanted to be as they were. He wanted their sympathies and their most thoughtful encouragement. He claimed a standing with them because he knew the workings of his own mind, and what he he most deserved at the hands of the whites. But what could such noble words mean to the uncultivated settlers? They had received too much wrong, vengeance intended for aggressors, not themselves, to see any nobility in any red man. Logan represented merely one of his abhorred race. They knew far more of the wrongs they themselves had suffered than of the deceits practiced upon the Indians. For with the honest settler there was too much to do about in his own little preserve for him to bother himself even with the deceit to the Indians. 
And so Logan might speak of the loss of his family, but had not they lost families too? How could Logan's empty wigwam appeal to the boy Lewis Wetzel? There were not even blackened walls of his own happy home remaining, and heavy tall grass obliterated the very landmarks his father had set up by dint of months and years of toil. And what of Logan's murdered family? Where was the father who had been watched for day after day, month after month, year after year by the boy on the little green knoll? The line of argument most popular at this time, can we trust Logan? Can Indians be trusted? They cannot. Therefore, we cannot trust an Indian. Must we pity Logan? Do Indians pity us? They do not. Therefore, we cannot pity an Indian. But should not Logan at least be tolerated? What is toleration? It is trust and pity. To tolerate Logan is to trust and pity an Indian. The boy Wetzel heard all such arguments around him, and was too young to understand anything except the rights of the settlers, which had been infringed upon and violated by Indians. He hated a word in favor of the red man. He is known to have engaged in bitter quarrels with people who advocated a peaceable adjustment of difficulties. For peace meant a giving in, an acknowledgment that the Indian had not been treated fairly, when in fact the Indian had been treated so fairly that he was allowed to live and every white man's hand by rights ought to be raised against a red man. It must not be, he said, it shall not be. When my time comes, it will not be. There is no peace for an Indian but what a bullet gives him. So Lewis Wetzel bided his time and waited for a man's strength. And it was, even as the mother had said, Martin too was bent on revenge. An expedition was set on foot in 1780 to proceed against and destroy the Indian town situated on the Kashikton, a small branch of the Muskingum River. The main place of rendezvous was Wheeling. Colonel Broadhead, a soldier of more than local distinction, assumed the command. Martin Wetzel was a volunteer in this campaign. The officers of those wild frontier armies were too often only such in name, for every soldier under them acted as seemed right in his own judgment and particular case. Cheered out of Wheeling, this little army of 400 men immediately took up the line of march and went forward rapidly in order to fall upon the Indian towns by surprise, and before any of the red spies ever on the alert should apprise the aggressed of the approach of foes. Colonel Broadhead, taking his men secretly along, soon surrounded one of the Indian towns before those inside were all aware of the proximity of any danger. According to Pritt's border life, every man, woman, and child were made prisoners without the firing of a gun. We read further on, among the prisoners were 16 warriors. A little after dark, a council of war was held to determine on the fate of the warriors in custody. They were doomed to death, and by the order of the commander were bound, taken a little distance below the town, and dispatched with tomahawks and spears, and then scalped. The first tomahawk raised was in the hand of Martin Wetzel. In the grim work of death, with a kind of fiendish pleasure, he sunk into the heads of the unresisting Indians a weapon which in hands like theirs had caused the death of his father. For the tomahawk was as much used by the whites as by the red men, and with an equal dexterity. Early the next morning an Indian presented himself on the opposite bank of the river and asked for the big captain. Colonel Broadhead presented himself and asked what the Indian wanted, to which he replied, I want peace. Send over some of your chiefs, said Broadhead. Maybe you kill, said the Indian. He was answered, they shall not be killed. One of the chiefs, a good-looking man, came over the river and entered into the conversation with a commander in the street. But while engaged in conversation, Martin Wetzel came up behind him with a tomahawk, concealed in the bosom of his hunting shirt, and struck him on the back of the head. The poor Indian fell and immediately expired. This act of perfidy and reckless revenge, the commander had no power if he had the disposition to punish, as probably two-thirds of the army approved of this treacherous deed. The next day, the army commenced its retreat from Kashakton. Colonel Broadhead committed the prisoners to the militia. They were about twenty in number. After they had marched about half a mile, the men commenced killing them. Again was the deadly weapon of Martin Wetzel crimsoned with the blood of his lifelong foes. And like his younger brother, such was his indomitable spirit of revenge that no place nor circumstance was sacred enough to preserve the life of an Indian when once within his grasp. And the word treachery was never employed by the settlers in any act that decoyed an Indian into their power. In a short time they were all dispatched except a few women and children who were spared and taken to Fort Pitt. 
and after some time exchange for an equal number of their prisoners. Some years after this horrible bloodthirsty action, but which in the eyes of the settlers, the circumstances of the time seemed to render unavoidable, Martin Wetzel hunting in the forest was surprised and taken prisoner by a party of predatory Indians. He remained with them a considerable length of time, and by his great cheerfulness and apparent satisfaction, disarmed their suspicion, acquired much of their confidence, and was adopted into one of their families, as was sometimes the case when the mode of savage life seemed congenial to a captive. But all this seeming gratification was the various dissimulation. Although Martin Wetzel showed a cheerful countenance, in his heart was brooding the spirit of revenge, and plans for his escape engaged every minute of his captivity. He desired, too, to make that escape memorable by some tragic action of revenge. How much he overreached by his acting the credulity of his entertainers, the sequel will show. He was to all intents and purposes free. He hunted with them, he danced and frolicked, and appeared thoroughly satisfied with the course affairs had taken, never showing distaste, although the Indians knew who he was and what had been the fate of his father. In the fall of that year, his dread chance came. He and three young chiefs set out to make a fall hunt to supply the winter stores of flesh. They pitched their camp near the head of the Sandusky River. During the hunting, he was careful to return to the camp in the evening, prepare the wood for the night fire, and do all the other duties of camp necessity, for he knew that, although he was trusted, his companions were ever on the alert, and that maybe he had been taken on this hunt merely to test the truthfulness of his protestations, and should any slip occur, he would suffer for it. By the line of conduct which he adopted, he lulled any suspicion they might have entertained of him, and little by little he saw the half-averted glance of discretion give way to open looks of full confidence. One evening, while hunting and belated, he came across one of his Indian campmates. The Indian was full of their mutual exploits, and praised the white man's wondrous aim. My father taught me, said Martin, sententiously. The Indian looked at him, for he knew the tale of John Wetzel's fate. But Martin's face was calm and unperturbed, and the chief went on with his talk. The white man watched for a favorable opportunity, and the Indian's attention being called in an opposite direction, he shot him down, scalped him, and threw his body into a hole made by the tearing up of a tree by the wind, and covered the motionless form with logs and brush. He then hurried to the camp, and prepared the wood for the night fire as usual. When night came down and the missing one not returning, Martin expressed great concern at the absence of their companion. Does my white brother worry about a warrior, laughed one of the Indians? For they did not appear in the least out of countenance or disconcerted on account of the non-arrival of the other, and dismissed the subject entirely from their minds as too trivial to entertain, ate their supper, and then lay down to sleep. Martin had gone too far now to retreat. He lay down with the others, but sleep was never further from his brain. The two Indians were soon unconscious. Being now determined at all hazards to escape, the question for Martin Wetzel to decide in his mind was whether he should attack both Indians while they slept, or watch for an opportunity of dispatching them one at a time. The latter plan seemed likelier to thwart failure. Early the next morning he prepared to execute his desperate plan. He was still apparently anxious about the continued absence of the chief, who had failed to come last night. It makes my white brother whiter, this fear, again laughed one of the remaining Indians, looking on the pallid and set face of the determined man. Wetzel made no reply, merely turning away. Then the two red men set out on their hunt alone, while death pursued them in the shape of Martin Wetzel, creeping like fate through the brush after them. All day he followed, stealthily keeping them in view. Towards night he came boldly up to them and began speaking and asking about their day's sport. One of the Indians sauntered off and Martin detained the other over some imaginary game until his fellow was far away. Then, with one fell sweep of the tomahawk, he lay the Indian lifeless on the ground. This is for my father, he said, and scalped the Indian and threw the body into the sinkhole, and made his way through brake and briar to the camp to meet the remaining Indian. He had not come when Martin arrived there, and throwing branches on the fire he sat down and waited, and soon saw the brave by the light of the fire, now fiercely flaming coming slowly on, with a burden of game thrown across his shoulders. With a strange, half-stifled cry of joy, the white man hurried forward, under the pretense of aiding in the disencumbering the hunter of his load. Stoop, he said, stoop. 
When the Indian stooped down to have the game detached from his back, the tomahawk, already so imbrued with blood of his kin, sunk into his brain, and Wetzel stood alone in the blackness of the night, guiltless in his own eyes. There was no danger of pursuit, so he proceeded very leisurely, and packed up whatever of the camping implements he deemed he most needed, and could most conveniently carry, and made his way to the white settlements with the three Indian scalps dangling from his belt of wampum, after an absolute of a year. Those who saw him coming over the hills and recognized him, despite his Indian trappings, cheered and greeted him as a hero. For the men who rid the country of a pest, and who protected otherwise defenseless women and children, were the right arm of the law, the strength of an exposed people. What they did, by whatever means they succeeded, could not be thought other than brave, the risks of success alone being considered, let alone their willingness to endure, for the sake of those that they resolved should endure no suffering. Thus Martin Wetzel's act of comparative perfidy, as it seems to us afar off, could meet with nothing but the approval of his countrymen upon this and similar occasions, and the greater his ingenuity and cunning to meet a like ingenuity and cunning, the greater the need of praise and approval. So that's it for this episode. As you can see, Louis Wetzel's older brother Martin made a similar vow of revenge against all Indians, and he was known to favor the tomahawk as his weapon of choice. On the website findagrave.com, there is a little bit more information on Martin Wetzel's life, which says the following. Born December 1757 in Rockingham County, Virginia, the eldest son of Captain John Wetzel, in 1769 he came west with his father's family, and in 1774 served in Dunmore's War. In 1777 he was at the Siege of Fort Henry at Wheeling, and aided in burying the dead after Captain Foreman's defeat. He was captured in April 1778 or 1779 and adopted into the family of Chief Cornstalk. He escaped from a band of Indians on a pretext that he was going into Kentucky to steal horses. In 1781 he returned over the Wilderness Road to his home near Wheeling. There he married Mary Coffell. During the remainder of his life, he was almost constantly engaged in scouting, and took part in 22 skirmishes, according to border annals, without receiving a wound. So that story places Martin's capture a little bit earlier than the book we just read from. It also identifies Chief Cornstalk's tribe as the one that captured Martin. In another Unworthy History video, we covered the Kerr's Creek Massacres in Virginia, which were led by Chief Cornstalk. I'll put a link to that video in the description. We also heard of the story of Chief Logan, who tried to live a civilized life but whose family was killed by General Cresap. Cresap's attack occurred on April 27, 1774, and preceded the Yellow Creek Massacre, which occurred on April 30th. These attacks took place near the current site of the Mountaineer Casino Racetrack and Resort. We will probably do an episode in the future to take a closer look at these massacres. This channel is called Unworthy History because we talk about actual history that is now deemed unworthy to show on history channels on TV, but there is a place for this unworthy history on this channel. Stay tuned for more actual history about people whose shoes we are unworthy to stand in. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.